Welcome to the Civil Society Futures and Innovation Podcast from the International Civil Society Centre. I'm Vicky Tung, Head of Futures and Innovation here at the Centre. I'm joined today by four collaborators, academics, practitioners and pracademics, who have long been discussing the big issues of power, relevance and legitimacy of international civil society organisations with each other and far more widely across the sector. They wrote a book on it last year and I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. I'm joined by four collaborators. They are George E. Mitchell, a professor of nonprofit management at Baruch College, City University of New York. Tosca Bruno van Fijveiken, consultant at Five Oaks Consulting, with over three decades of experience working with NGO leaders and change managers. Hans Peter Schmidt, a professor of leadership studies at the University of San Diego. And Barney Talak, a consultant on international civil society organization strategy and transformation, and a former director of strategy at Oxfam International. Thank you all for joining me today. Thanks for the opportunity. So we're going to hear from all of you together and share your thoughts. But as a kind of starting point, through your kind of collective experience, through your research, your consultancies, your podcasting, when you regularly speak to leaders in the civil society sector, I would like a quick sense check from all of you as to where you think the leaders of these international civil society organisations are in relation to the need or case for transformative change around some of the big questions on power and relevance in the sector. Is it a lack of awareness or a lack of action? Perhaps that's the starting point. And I think it will be a really interesting place to start and see if we, if we all agree on that. So, George, starting with you, where do you think the sector leaders are on this? I think there's a pretty widespread awareness about the need for change and action, but also a kind of frustration around the difficulties implementing change. And that's led to a kind of anxiety that organizations might underperform or might fail to adapt over the long term. Thanks. And Tosca? I think leaders, as George said, do have that awareness. They see the pandemic as one more example of an externally triggered change, which they need to be responsive to. But whether they will use the occasion to really change in ways that the sector, in our view, was already overdue for is something I'm not sure about. Interesting. And uh, Hans, your view? Yeah, I think there's also certainly a lot of variation in the sector, right? Some people are certainly thought leaders. I think about this on a daily basis, while others may be more stuck in the day-to-day and just thinking about how they can sort of keep their organization going. And so the awareness is also an issue that's driven by, you know, how much leaders think they have the luxury to think about long-term issues. And Barney, your thoughts as well, please. Very similar to the others. Plus, I think for those who do know that something has to happen and they do have to change, the struggle is perhaps more in the how and what does that look like in the future? Yeah, I would totally second that from the work that we do with the global strategists in our scanning the horizon futures work. It's very much looking for models and inspiration and examples of how and how to manage all the different levels of change that need to happen at the same time. So going back to the kind of longer term context and and case for change, which I know you've you've all been analysing and and looking at together for quite some time now. You've obviously collaborated together on a book, which we're going to cover some of the big ideas from in this interview. Starting with you, George, how did you go about breaking down this really big case for change into different elements that you were able to analyse and consider separately and make it more manageable to think about? Sure. So we've been collaborating very intensively over the past 15 years or so, I think it's been, among us authors and Barney more recently. And we've observed that there are many thoughtful practitioners in the sector who understand that change is needed. And we've already been seeing a lot of innovations and attempts at innovations in a lot of promising areas. And over the years, we've sort of identified some of these spaces where we're seeing change already around areas like strategy, accountability, the movement toward more digital technologies, measurement and evaluation is a big one. Of course, governance leadership, and collaboration, and especially when there is uh, financial hardship in the sector, mergers and acquisitions tends to come up as an area of great interest. So these are all areas that I think rightly receive a lot of attention as well as activity. We've also seen these as areas where practitioners encounter a lot of frustration and obstacle. So we thought this was an interesting problem. There are these obstacles to change out there, and we wanted to understand better 
where are they coming from and how can practitioners think about these obstacles in a more productive way. So in the book, basically we lay out our framework and argue that it's this larger architecture in which NGOs or international CSOs are embedded that ultimately is responsible for a lot of these challenges, change leaders, strategy directors, and other leaders are facing throughout the sector. And basically we go through these different areas, area by area to show how this larger architecture is presenting obstacles for change and adaptation throughout the sector. And so could you summarize the case for change as you see it based on both this longer term thinking, but also looking at some of the current conversations that have happened with the kind of turbulent times that we've all experienced over the past year, and also like within the lens of these kind of architectural constraints that you talk about? So certainly right now with COVID affecting everyone and and CSOs, of course, as well, we're seeing a lot of concern and anxiety around survival that may be taking precedence over this longer term need to change and respond to more long term change drivers. I think what's really at stake here is that we will recover here from this current crisis as we have during the last so-called Great Recession in 08-09. I think the sector will continue to probably grow both in terms of its resources and in numbers of organizations. But what's at stake is whether these organizations will grow and multiply and also be accountable and also be effective and relevant at the same time. And it's that latter part that I'm most concerned with. Because of the nature of the way international CSOs and NGOs, or you might use the term like nonprofits or charities, are kind of structured in law and thought of it in cultural terms, There's a possibility that these organizations could continue to sort of grow and flourish, financially speaking and almost bureaucratically speaking, while also failing to really perform and advance the missions in a way that uh, the sector wants to be doing and doing better. So I think what's at stake is this larger part about the sector's future in terms of relevance, accountability, and effectiveness. And that part is in no way guaranteed. And I think there's some anxiety among practitioners that some organizations might already be in that area or, or, or feel correctly or incorrectly that they're not performing and adapting as well as they ought to be. So there are some clear challenges linked to architecture and business models. Tosco, I'd like to talk to you about kind of organizational culture and organizational culture for innovation. I think George just touched on this briefly. I mean, I think the, the need and speed to innovate and be better prepared to face an uncertain future has really become clearer than ever. We've seen this so clearly, so starkly, been really exposed over the past year. And, you know, as we discussed earlier, leaders may be aware of the case for change, but these organizational cultures have to enable these to happen. So what are some of the other barriers around leading change in these organizations? First, I think in the book, we are trying to really operationalize culture, which a lot of us like to talk about, but in a fairly fuzzy way. So we really operationalize it as the habits and behaviors that are widely shared and that are kind of habitually reproduced in an organization based on what has been favored in the past, what has been rewarded or what has been uh, discouraged. And so we also know in our sector that if we want to change culture, we need to start with choosing just a few kind of habits or behaviors at a time because people cannot hold more than a few priorities in their head at any one time. And we need to reinforce those through leadership modeling. We need to really be clear in choosing our champions, our networkers, our early adopters and our examples, people who have, who already exemplify the behavior, hold those people up and kind of go viral that way. I am not sure that that's how I see culture change happening in this sector. And then when it comes to kind of, can we use this time of the pandemic as a further, if you will, thrust towards innovation, I'm not yet fully seeing that a number of sacred priorities are taken off the table, or maybe that we should say everything is on the table. Maybe I should say it that way. I'm not sure we are entirely there yet because the pandemic-induced crisis can also call up in us a kind of a defensive crouch, right? Where we're not expansive in our innovation, but we're, we're kind of closing in. And then finally to say that when it comes to the fact that we're all collaborating virtually now, So we know from the research in other sectors on virtual collaboration that virtual collaboration can work well in a number of ways, 
depending on how we do it, but it's not the greatest way for kickstarting or adopting innovation. Because for innovation, we need to kind of bump into each other haphazardly in the hallways, if you will, literally. And that is the bumping up of people and lenses that are very different, right? Perspectives that are very different is much harder in a virtual environment to do. So these are just a couple of comments. So where are entry points or good examples or interesting models of change which is actually happening and going beyond rhetoric that you've seen in all your conversations or that you hear about and you kind of hold up as as good examples for others to hear about or follow? We're very keen, us kind of practitioners in, in our consulting roles, we're very keen, for instance, to see to what extent do we see real desire and an uptake of a shift in roles. What kind of roles are still appropriate? And now I'm pulling it also at the whole kind of discussion on anti-racism, decolonializing aid, et cetera. What kind of roles are still appropriate for ICSOs if we really acknowledge the full maturity of Global South Civil Society, right? Is that about ICSOs primarily playing a campaign role in global North countries and targets, et cetera, institutions? Is that being a backbone organization to a global uh, network that primarily consists of global South organizations and therefore kind of supporting the collective impact of that network? Is that by offering a very specific technical expertise niches or consulting services in those technical areas? primarily upon request, is that by publicly educating constituencies in the global north that the issues that they are grappling with, poverty, inequality, climate change, etc., are unavoidably linked with those in the global south, etc. I'm not sure that we see a real concerted effort to go in that direction. I will highlight, for instance, I just interviewed the CEO of a Canadian NGO that works in the area of business solutions to poverty. And so they are in the early stages of really thinking through what it means for them to go from still forms of direct implementation of such business solutions to poverty to only doing convening. So what does that mean for the strategy? What does it mean for the kind of people we need to have in the organization and their competencies? What does it mean for the board composition and so on? And I think that that is an interesting example. You know, based on what you've mentioned, there's this kind of case for change and innovation coming from the outside in and from the inside out. In what order is there kind of the driver, the innovation and the culture? Obviously, it's not linear. How do you see leaders trying to engage with the change or catalyze the change? I think to some extent, we need to come to terms with the fact that we all have divided what actually yesterday in my podcast recording this CEO called as divided loyalties. So we all say that we are about working ourselves out of jobs, et cetera, but actually our identities, not just our jobs and our economic realities as ICSO staff and leaders, but our identities are so tied up with our work that the fact that we, on the one hand, want to work for a public good, but on the other hand, also very much want to maintain our jobs, our teams, our access to power and status and privilege, our ego, if you will, and I mean that in a value neutral way, is not very fully acknowledged nor talked about. That is all that we have these divided loyalties. And in a nutshell, those divided loyalties mean that we are probably ambivalent about real change because I think real change is going to mean that a number of organizations are going to shrink significantly and or disappear. And that is a very hard thing to do. We know from psychology that when we think of ourselves as do-gooders and as being involved in morally upstanding things, then we're all the more brittle, actually, about the idea that we might be standing in the way of change or that we might be doing harm, as we saw in the, uh, the recent couple of years with the sexual abuse scandal. So we've got quite a few challenges. So we're hearing about some of the constraints through the architecture. We're hearing about leaders who struggle to engage with change because of divided loyalties. I'd like to talk a bit about where we are with digital innovation, Hans. 
maybe there's something a bit more positive to say here. We'll see. But I know you look at these things in depth. What general conclusions are you drawing about where organisations are currently with their digital capacities, strategies and tactics versus where you think they need to be? This is a chapter in our book that basically, as, as George explains, builds on our overall argument and draws from that overall argument. And the way I observe the sector is that a lot of the organizations that we write about in the book were, of course, formed long before the digital age came about. So they are from the 1940s or 50s or Amnesty International in the 1960s. So they're not digital natives. And a lot of their leadership is not necessarily used to this kind of issue. So that goes to Doska's point about are the leaders that are currently in charge of these organizations capable of embracing such fundamental change? So that's, that's one side of the story. The other side of the story is what George points out is the architecture, which is in the digital realm is very important, but it's not just limited to that. It's the perennial issue that many civil society organizations have is lack of resources, right? So if you want to accomplish change and if you want to transform, you have to invest. And this is where a lot of NGOs and a lot of civil society groups face this challenge of not having the resources to digitally transform in the way they should. Now, there are, of course, a lot of positive examples. I'll I'll mention Amnesty International, which a while ago created the Decoder program, right, where they're trying to pull in their members to help them with looking at satellite images in Darfur or, you know, that the staff alone couldn't do on their own, right? They wouldn't have the capacity. So digital becomes a something that these NGOs can use in order to sort of delegate some of their really important tasks to their members. So that's a very good example, very promising, but those examples are kind of far and not as common as they should be today. And there's also a whole host of new digital experiments, models, ways of organizing and catalyzing social change that are out there that could be inspired by. What do you see as these kind of emerging things that they could adapt or or look to as a kind of inspiration for where they need to be? There are lots and lots, of course, of new players, right? And so we can name a bunch. Like we can talk about change.org. We can talk about some of us. We can talk about the open network that came out of the move on movement. And all of these are digital native. We can talk about Kiva. (laughs) And so what is unique about these? I mean, we can talk about it in great depth, but there are certainly two things that are different when we compare these kinds of new players with the traditional international civil society organization. The first one is they don't rely on intermediation, right? The main role that many international civil society organizations fulfill is they intermediate. They collect money in rich countries and then do something in poorer countries. And a lot of these digital platforms basically cut out this kind of middleman. So that's a major challenge that any organization has to deal with. The other really important challenge is that a lot of the ICSOs that came about before the digital age are really expertise driven, right? (laughs) The reason why they exist is because they're able to provide expertise about human rights, about development. And these are their assets that they're bringing to bear. And so in the digital age, sometimes, you know, a lot of these new players don't necessarily rely on this expertise, but they essentially, what Tosca points out to, they're more in the facilitation or the organizing rather than the doing. themselves, right? And so I think these two things, the challenge to intermediation and the challenge to expertise-driven activism is something that all international civil society organizations should sort of deal with and grapple. I'm not saying everyone needs to become like change.org, right? There's, of course, plenty of space for intermediation. There's plenty of space for expertise-driven activism. It's just that civil society organizations need to think a little bit more about what's their place in the digital space. George, I think you've got something to add there. Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to follow up with what Hans was saying, and maybe he can elaborate a little bit on this in the German case. But when we talk about the architecture in the book, we're referring to the the forms and norms that define the sector. And by forms, we mean both how CSOs uh, are 
sort of organized and, and structured or governed transnationally, but also uh, what their form is in terms of generally being incorporated or registered as some kind of a charitable organization in some countries. So in the U.S. case, NGOs, CSOs are generally incorporated as what are called public charities here, which subjects you to a whole set of regulatory framework and a set of expectations and a whole cultural understanding of what it means to be a charity, even though you might see yourself as an organization doing activism and advocacy and being a change agent, you're still fundamentally sort of understood and regulated as a charitable organization. And in the digital world, that can be a, a real limitation because a lot of organizations have found out over time that to really have change stick and be sustainable, you need to be more political. You need to do more lobbying and political kinds of activities. But if you're a charitable organization, that might not only be going against the grain of what's expected in terms of your role, but it could be illegal. It could be against the law. And Hans, I know there are a couple of examples in Germany where this actually became a problem. Do you want to maybe elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, I mean, there are two great examples, right? And it also goes with the point that Tosca made before about how maybe the future of many of these traditional international civil society organizations is not in bridging the gap between the rich and the poor. It's in lobbying the rich. And so the two examples that come to mind in the last two years in Germany are Attack and Compact. And both of these organizations, Compact and Attack, Attack works on tax equality, global, and Compact works on climate change, lost their, their charitable status in Germany because they are deemed as doing political activities. Or to give you another example, in Switzerland, a couple of weeks ago, we had a campaign for corporate responsibility that you, know, you could sue companies in Switzerland for what happens in their supply chains. And this created a major backlash because the NGOs and the civil society groups were seen as becoming too political and involved in politics. So we see very clearly that the architecture is a real stumbling block to civil society organizations accomplishing their increasingly ambitious goals and their changing goals. So bringing all this together, I think the constraints of the architecture the need to look at new business models, new leadership models, culture change, fast track digital assets and capacity. Barney, where does this kind of leave international civil society organisations given this? I mean, I think you've, you've discussed some different possibilities, their ability to transform or die well or die badly. You know, how do you see these beginning to play out? So I think what we are seeing in a number of the of the families, which is who I mostly work with, people getting the need to transform and driven partly by the money, but driven by a, an understanding that it's about relevance and really questioning whether they are still relevant in the world as we know it. And from that opening of questioning relevance, revisiting their mandate, revisiting their role, revisiting their niche, their focus, we're seeing I'm certainly seeing INGO board, global board discussions around, do we need to grow in income terms? Or is that the way that we should move forward? That's been our traditional pattern for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You know, more money equals more impact. And actually, do we move out of that model? And so you'll see many boards think that new way and actually focus, let's re revisit our role. Where I think some are doing better than others in terms of transforming is taking the direction for what their role or their niche or their area of expertise should be taking their direction from the rest of the movement so well in the past we've seen nine years be quite confident and assertive about what they bring to the party actually beginning to ask particularly southern civil society organizations about actually what is valued what is useful what are, what are we actually good at and conversely what are we not so good at that you don't really want now i'd like to say that all INGOs are doing that, or some are and some aren't. I think some of the other things you've seen in transform, in the transforming around people thinking in new, you know, new ways of working, some of the things we've discussed, for example, and changing their relationship with other actors. So if I think of, you know, when I started, it was very much third sector, good, public sector, all right corporate sector bad and actually people thinking much more about actually the relationship with those other actors is very different now 
and the power of the corporate sector to actually achieve change at scale is very different. So what does the INGL ICSO bring to that? And instead of thinking of those either as campaign targets or as sources of income, thinking more about actually some of these progressive organisations, they know the problem, they know climate change is an issue, they know inequality is an issue. How can we now work with them on solutions? So transforming your role quite dramatically vis-a-vis -vis stakeholders, partners, other actors in the North, but most importantly, being driven in the way you transform by the desires, needs from the rest of the movement, primarily in the South. So if they don't transform, they could also either die well or die badly. What do you mean by that? I mean, die well is a perfectly legitimate way of achieving the mission. I think it's a, a good approach. We've seen it in lots of other sectors many, many years ago, even centuries ago, you know, organisations that said, we've broadly done what we can do. And actually, what can we now hand over to others to do? And that might be technical expertise, it might be relationships, it might be other assets that can be given away, or you can spin out, or through mergers, or being taken over. All of those are ways of basically dying well. As I say, that's a legitimate way of transferring your ability to make impact to a new generation of actors. And if they don't do that, of course, we are seeing some that I would say are heading to the die badly endpoint, where because of their conviction and passion, fantastic, but allied to a unwillingness to critique their uniqueness, their role and their relevance, will are already being left out of discussions and the rest of the movement, other actors just don't see them as relevant. They're decreasingly relevant and also in the eyes of big funders, and publics and so from all sides they become less and less and less relevant and there's a less painful outcome which is quietly disappearing and there's a more painful outcome which is really hitting the wall and crashing and dying badly. So what you often hear is we can't change because of donors and I mean I think I'm interested in this you know how much is the ability to change from within the sector and that's a convenient excuse to say that donors need to change and then we will change and how much of it can truly be self-initiated from within the sector. I do think that the same kind of divided loyalties that we see within our ICSOs both in the individual but also in leaders and collectives you see it in donors too, very much so. And so, you know, we talk in the book, of course, about the fact that the overhead myth, so the idea that we need to minimize our, our costs going to overhead administration and fundraising is though a weaker norm than it was before, it's still alive and kicking enough. And we also know that we as a sector have not been, I think, very effective in influencing donors to change their stance, right? So I think it is partially an excuse because we don't want to look the gap between what we say we are about and what we really are about, or at least the mix of things that we are about, look that straight in the eye. So then we blame others. And in the same time, you know, a number of the newer generation of donors are just not funding ICSOs anymore. They think that this sector is largely irrelevant from their perspective, and they have moved on to the other types of actors that Hans, for instance, pointed out, the digital platforms, the social enterprises, the impact investors, etc. And unless you're an NGO like, for instance, Habitat for Humanity here in the U.S., that has really a number of years ago started moving towards shared value, right? And adopting impact investing approaches inside their organization. We're not going to draw these newer types of donors. Following up on what Tosca said, I think we all recognize that donors exist within the same architecture that CSOs are confronting. And th this system or architecture was designed for different kinds of organizations in a very different time. And one of the sort of underpinnings of this way of organizing and way of thinking about social change, or back then more the charity model, was that you, you can't really know or, or measure or determine what these CSOs are accomplishing. So instead, the sort of regulatory apparatus that NGOs and CSOs are subjected to is really organized around the surveillance of financial information and upward reporting to donors. So if you're a traditional charity, and you show through your financial reporting that you have low overhead, you're not hoarding money, 
you're spending your money as immediately as possible on current programs to help people now, that's an indicator of trustworthiness that you're a good organization. A century probably or more, this has been put forward to donors as this is how you pick a good charity. This is what it means to be a trustworthy organization worthy of your support. Absent from this whole system, this whole architecture is any kind of real transparency around outcomes and mission success and accomplishments. If you're a donor and you want to support organizations that are accomplishing long-term change, there's no way to find that information, to, to really find those organizations in an efficient way and to reward them for their accomplishments. Instead, what you're given is these lists of you know, who has the highest executive compensation or who has the highest or lowest overhead. And that's part of this mentality that pervades the architecture, having come from this tradition of charity, where success and goodness and virtue is defined by financial stewardship and avoiding scandal, rather than are you making a difference in the lives of the people you're claiming to serve? And that's a problem culturally. It's a problem in terms of the sector's infrastructure. And it's a problem in many cases in terms of public policy in many countries. I recognize that collusion in some cases between donors and some of the larger organizations when it comes to contract income, if you like, institutional income, donors passing risk and compliance challenges to a large northern-based organization. So I, I recognize that. We know there's going to be less money. There already is less money from those donors, you know, whether it's the Australians or the UK or wherever. So there's an opportunity there to go, well, actually, if the money's shrinking, let's think differently. And where those forms are built up over time based on contract income, instead of thinking, oh, how do we replace that income and stay big? Actually thinking about it is okay to be smaller and using less money to, you know, using your expertise be part of those consortia that new donors are interested in. So some of those, some of the donors we talk about, some of the East Coast donors, some of the foundations are really interested in consortia of Southern civil society organizations, some tech startup here and, you know, impact investing there. And we're very happy to convene and bring those together and also to take more risk, to try new things. They're less hung up as donors about organizational form and the ability to deliver at scale with you know with compliance in the same way so given the need to transform but some of the constraints around that you know what are the kind of like words of hope or inspiration that you have kind of a last takeaway for leaders in the sector to take away from from everything that you've seen where those leaders in the sector recognize the challenge and when they are asking and with humility asking uh, you know other parts of the movement you're seeing that others do want a particular thing. Actually, they may be better at a particular thing than they realise, and that, that gives them the ability to focus. There are some interesting examples of an organisation you know, started many, many years ago as a service delivery organisation doing eye operations, you know, years and years and years ago. And an interesting example of how they completely shifted their thinking about their role was them in Pakistan and a startup tech company in the UK, down the road, not far from me, which worked out how to do eye tests on mobile phones, and the Pakistan Ministry of Health. And the role that the, you know, the organisation that used to provide eye operations, uh, the role that it can now play, which is useful and did play in this particular example, was to be able to convene national partners. So it wasn't them, it was convening national partners who worked on eye health type issues, bringing in the, the startup, the tech startup that didn't have any rootedness in program and the Ministry of Health. And so their role was really as a technical expert and a convener. Consequently, this technology has been rolled out across huge parts of the country by the Ministry of Health. But the organisation itself, is, you know, it's a fraction of what it would have done uh, and what it would have to raise money for in the past. So that may be an, an example. And I think there is hope in terms of use this opportunity where we're at the moment. Finances are tough. Use that opportunity to make some strategic choices. Did any others of you want to kind of come in on the kind of final thoughts for where this leaves? One thing I think leaders, change managers and other stakeholders should consider is a need for collective action throughout the sector. A lot of the reforms we've been talking about today occurred within individual organizations where 
leadership felt this sense, this urgency for change, and they initiated that change. But those kinds of changes that happen at the organizational level can only go so far and ultimately are going to run up against these deeper challenges posed by the architecture. So the solution is going to involve, I think, long-term things like changing the, the culture of the sector more broadly to perhaps become more outcome oriented to, in some cases, lobby governments to change the way in which the sector is regulated. It may involve organizations adopting and experimenting with different organizational forms in terms of social entrepreneurship and in terms of other kinds of innovations where they're incubating organizations that can spin off and maybe they're for-profit or maybe they're quasi-governmental or maybe they're some kind of a hybrid type organization. There needs to be more done, I think, collectively for the sector to reimagine what it is and what it wants to be for the future and then to create an environment domestically and internationally that's more conducive to their current aspirations. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, CSOs and NGOs were different kinds of organizations. They were more like conventional charities seeking to address the immediate problems right in front of them. Today, these organizations are more likely to want to address the root causes of societal problems through sustainable change. That's a different kind of organization. That's a different kind of a mission, a different kind of a mandate. You need a different architecture to support that kind of work to enable these new kinds of organizations with these new mandates to really reach their full potential. And I don't think individual org level reforms are going to get the sector all the way to that finish line. I think there needs to be some more collaboration across organizations, across leadership, across boards to imagine what a more conducive environment or architecture might look like and to start strategizing about where do we start and what's the vision for the future that we have that we can work together to try to achieve. I could just add maybe to George's yeah. point there. So I think ICSOs, INGOs, TNGOs, moving away from that approach, you know, we are soup to nuts, you know, we do, we do all of it and in isolation, we run a global campaign, you know, that sort of mentality. Whereas I would say even up to maybe a few years ago, you still had organizations, some of the families creating mini me's in countries in the South as a way of creating global balance, actually changing that dynamic because some of them now thinking that's not the way to do it. It's actually how do we work in alliance, strategic partnerships with national partners who are equal to us and changing that narrative of, you know, we are the family and then we plant we plant our ourselves in these countries. And so I think collaborate is the key there. You know, it's much more alliances and networks that's worked well in the advocacy campaigning space, but actually bringing that to some of the other parts of the mandate as well. And I'm not saying that people haven't been doing it for decades. I just think it's it's moving from that uh, sort of more hierarchical, insular, almost insular, self-contained uh, mode of organisational form that more needs to happen on that front. I think that's a really good place to leave it. I think we could talk about this for hours, but, you know, this kind of sense that it's a real opportunity to transform, work together on how to do that as individual organisations, but also as a sector. I think the centre is really keen to see and be a part of these conversations and convening them. So what's next for your collaboration together and what are your hopes for the book? I think we're, we're just trying to get the word out. I think we've sensed throughout our collaboration that there are a lot of practitioners who are very anxious about their role, about the roles of their organizations. And there's been a, an egregious sort of underserving of the, of the sector by academia and by consultants and other you know, thoughtful people. If you're in business, there are thousands and thousands of books written every month probably to help people think through strategic challenges. And in the CSO sector, there's some of that, but not enough. And we don't want to see people just borrowing from the business literature. I think the CSO sector has its own challenges that are very unique to the CSO sector itself. And I hope the book is serving that audience of, of thoughtful practitioners, and it will help people initiate change more effectively and think about how to enact future change more productively. So I think we'll leave it there. I think the inspiration and the insights that you've given and having these conversations together are really important. And the centre looks forward to being part of these as well. Good luck with the book. And thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. You can find more information on George, Hans and Tosca's book, 
between power and irrelevance, the future of transnational NGOs, along with links to guest blogs they and Barney have written on the Centre's website and their biographies, all in the podcast description. And thanks, as always, to our producer, Julia Pazos, and we will see you next time for more on civil society features and innovation.